Thank you for joining this uh, global vigil, 24 hour global vision brought by uh, Together We Remember. Um, stories have been told through music for millennia, often to help our children to sleep through lullabies. And today we're going to be hearing two songs uh, that have been written to, uh, for our children, for young people to help wake them to the realities of genocide and atrocities, but also to the best in humanity to help inspire uh, humanity in all of us. Uh, this month is Genocide Awareness Month. Uh, it's uh, this month we remember all victims of genocide. It was the month in which the genocide against the Tutsi began uh, 26 years ago. It's the uh, month in which we remember the Armenian Genocide and the Yom HaShoah, the destruction of the Warsaw Ghetto. This, this uh, segment of the 24-hour vigil uh, is brought to you by the uh, national, UK's National Holocaust Centre uh, and also the Kigali Genocide Memorial. It was a great privilege for uh, myself uh, to be involved with my brother and parents in founding the uh, Holocaust Center in the UK, uh, in, uh, which opened in 1995, a place of permanent memory uh, where there are uh, exhibitions to record the uh, stories of survivors and the history, the context around that, but it's also a place of education, uh, education that uh, seeks to inspire us to make the world a better, safer, fairer place. And uh, the Kigali Genocide Memorial was in some ways uh, inspired by the Holocaust Center. It was a center that was founded uh, by the government of Rwanda, uh, by the Kigali uh, City Council, uh, who visited the Holocaust Center uh, in the UK some uh, uh, some years ago, 2002 uh, and 2003, and it's been a great privilege for me and uh, my colleagues at Aegis Trust to be involved in uh, helping to develop and run the uh, genocide memorial with survivors of genocide and uh, for the uh, government uh, of Rwanda. We're going to start with uh, our first song first film, um, Edek. Um, it, it's, um, some would say, perhaps a, an unusual genre uh, of, of music uh, to tell a story of the Holocaust. It's the uh, story uh, of um, our first uh, guest, uh, Janine Weber, who herself was uh, a child uh, during the Holocaust, born in Poland. And we're going to have a chance to hear more from her shortly about why she um, was involved in creating this song uh, and uh, you'll have opportunity to speak with her and ask uh, questions shortly. Um, straight after we've had a chance to discuss with Janine, uh, we'll be then hearing a song written and performed by Clava uh, Irokose, who is also with us, a Tutsi survivor of the 1994 uh, genocide and we'll also have a chance to hear more about his story and you will have opportunity to talk with him and ask him questions uh, from the uh, Facebook page, page. so please uh, be prepared with your questions. So this film, the song is Edek. Wrong. 
but the Ukrainians didn't like the Jews. So the first thing that happened, they started killing. What? Born a Jew Doesn't mean much to the likes of me and you Oh Janine, Janine Where have you been? What have you seen? A child on the run from a killer machine mm. Edic mm -hmm. We lived on the second floor okay. And I heard one day the Gestapo Shouting And I heard one day the Gestapo We hid this hole under the wardrobe. And my father came running in and he said, the Germans are after me. Oh, we were Jewish. To escape, he jumped. He jumped. Jump, daddy, jump. Try to get away, make a leap for freedom just to live another day. Run, daddy, run. Get up from the floor. Can't you hear them laughing while they're breaking down the door? Fly, daddy, fly, fly so high. I promise that your baby girl will try not to die. I'll try not to die, try not to cry. Fly, daddy, fly. Fly, daddy, fly. Fly, daddy, fly. Fly, daddy, fly. I promise that your baby girl. They shot my father, shot my grandmother. My mother died in the ghetto. Mm -hmm. They killed my brother, who was seven. Seven years old. Think about that. Edek. A young man called Edek, a Polish Catholic. He hid 14 Jews. Edek. Because in Poland, if they saw somebody hiding Jews, they would shoot them immediately. There were no questions. Quite an incredible man. He risked his life. I'm forever grateful to him. He risked his life. Edek. He's a hero to hide people. I never knew his surname. I only knew his first name. Janine, it's a great privilege for 
us to have you join us today and thank you for, for being here to uh, share a, a little bit more with us and to answer some of our questions. Uh, Janine, can I start by asking you why, why did you work with a hip hop artist to, make, to tell your story? The idea came from uh, the filmmakers, my friend uh, Mark Cave and Malcolm Green. And I, I thought it was such a good idea because the young people, they, it would be more accessible. They watched uh, YouTube and they see people, hip hop mu music. And uh, for me, it was at first a little strange, but now when I see it, I'm very moved. I think it's absolutely wonderful. And it's important to show people of all races, because we are, as I said in the film, we are all human beings. Mm. And to try and understand why Edek is such an extraordinary person um, for, for, for you and for the messages he brings to us. Can you explain a little bit more about what was happening to you and your family? We, we, we understood some of that story through, through the song and through the video, uh, but you were, you were nine years old at the time. Yes, uh, I was nine and of my first experience was when the Nazis, the Gestapo, were rounding up Jewish men. And we were in our flat, my mother, my brother and I, and my father came running in and he said, the Germans after me. And he jumped from our second floor balcony onto the first floor balcony and hid underneath. My ma mother had to open the door. The Gestapo came in. And that was my first experience of seeing armed, uh, armed soldiers, and I couldn't understand what was going on. And then we continuously had to hide, we hid in a hole under the wardrobe, and eventually we finished in the ghetto. And I managed to get out after about 10 months or a year the conditions in the ghetto were atrocious. I managed to get out and I found uh, eventually various jobs and a family who hid my brother and me. My uncle paid for them to hide us and they betrayed us. They called in an, a German soldier or an SS. Uh, and I knew he was going to kill us, but for some reason he didn't want to kill me. And they killed my brother. And they threw me out. And eventually after moving around, I, uh, I had with me the name and address of Edek, who was the friend of my family, a young 19 year old, Catholic, a, con a, a night watchman of a convent. I found him and uh, he, I told him who I was and he told me to follow him. And eventually I met 14 Jews. We were hiding in a hole under the stables floor. And I stayed in that hole for nearly a year. And this was 1943. Um, it was 1943. The same year as the destruction of the Warsaw Ghetto. And the Lwów Ghetto. Mm -hmm. And of course you were in the east of Poland in, in, in Lwów. Yes. Uh, we've had a question on uh, Facebook from Kelly Scott, uh, who said that she's found Edek a really powerful and impactful way of sharing your testimony, Janine. Uh, but she wants to ask you what message you want young people to take away from the actions of Edek. Well, Edek, of course, is 
a hero to me. And there were a few others who helped the Jews, but were many others who didn't. And uh, my message is not to accept that people, innocent people, are persecuted, not to remain silent, but protest, stand up, do whatever you can in your power to fight against persecution of the innocent. Thank you. Thank you, Janine. Um, there's a comment from Gar Gary Mulraney um, on the uh, Facebook. He's, he said this is an amazing story uh, told through song and in particular through a genre that connects with all people. Um, Janine, we're going to have time to come back and um, for our participants to ask you more questions. But uh, I wanted to introduce um, uh, Clava Irokozi, who's uh, with us in uh, Rwanda uh, at the moment. And um, uh, Clava wrote uh, a song and performed a song and created uh, 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 an animation to go with this song. And before he comments on it, uh, we'll, we'll take a look, Clava, and come back to you in just a moment to ask you why Again, you use this medium and, and, and why you wrote this song. This is the legacy of history. Again, Claver was 11 years old during the genocide in 1994 when he witnessed these scenes that we're about to see in this short video. Muraje wa mateka warat kuwate Muraje wa mateka warat kuwate Tu 
I know this is a particularly difficult week for you. Uh, it's the 26th anniversary in which your father was taken away from the school in which you were hiding. Um, can you first um, start again by explaining to us why you made this video and, and wrote this song? Thank you, James. Um, the video, I would say, was born uh, out of a nostalgic feeling uh, for my parents and I wanted to pay tribute to them and so I wrote the song as a love letter to them but I also wanted to express my um, gratitude to them for the time we spent together but also give them some news, news that uh, have grown up uh, my siblings and myself that we are all strong um, also news about their grandchildren, uh, my kids, basically. So, but beyond that, they also wanted to uh, honor their memory at the same time, start working on um, the huge responsibility as a survivor of transmitting the memory of the genocide to the next generation. I read a very poignant letter that you wrote to your parents uh, this month uh, that was published in the New Times of, of uh, Rwanda. Um, I was very, very moved. If anybody wants to look that up, they should, I would urge you to do so, the New Times of uh, Rwanda and uh, type in Claver's name. Claver, uh, um, there's a, a comment uh, from Serge Ruigamba um, when listening to Janine's story and to and knowing your story, uh, he says, wow, how uh, the similar experiences there were, rounding people up, running, uh, joining the uh, terrorized crowd and being, uh, being taken away. And um, it was, a, uh, you know, for an 11-year-old boy, this, this was a, must have left a profound experience, um, uh, memories uh, on you, particularly now that you have children of your, your own. How do, you, how do you deal with, with, with conveying your story to your own children? Thank you, James. Um, uh, 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 this takes me back to the time uh, I was still living with my parents. They were very uh, courageous and protective people. They tried all they could uh, despite the uh, very violent atmosphere of the time. They, uh, taught us to um, respect people, um, to obey and so on. And this is um, what I'm trying to do with my kids, uh, to let them know who these people were. And uh, for me, I feel like, you know, investing in um, educating my kids is what could make my parents who are no longer with me uh, proud of, of the person I've become. So I do it because I know these kids and the next generation, uh, the young generation um, in general, they will outlive us. So they need to understand what the past was and the mistakes we um, endured in the past so that in their lifetime, they don't see themselves perpetrating violence. Mm. Uh, Janine and Claver, um, you both seen each other's videos and heard each other's songs. Uh, do you have any questions for each other? Well, um, 
if I may, I would like to know how uh, this uh, terrible atrocity and losing a lot of members of your family, how, how has it affected you? How do you feel now? Um, it wasn't easy, especially in the aftermath when we had to live on our own, uh, a new life uh, that was very difficult. But uh, the strong bond between myself and siblings and uh, coming together to support each other started um, helping us to make some steps in life. And also the support we were having from the government to be able to go back to school, to study. Uh, those were things that were really making us busy and try to forget, not really to forget, but to focus on, on what we could become in life. And so um, I kind of developed this sense of uh, positive revenge, revenge of uh, not allowing myself to uh, sit down and accept uh, death, if, if I may say. So uh, I always wanted to revenge myself against the people who killed my parents and the, the perpetrators of the genocide against the Tutsi in general by becoming someone in life, by, by, by doing something that will probably help them to learn a lesson um, and learn human values, at least the young generation um, of theirs. So keeping busy, studying, trying to become some, some, something in life is, is what helped me to, to cope uh, with the legacy of the genocide. And of course, uh, being involved in the work of preserving the memory through Edges Trust and the Kigali Genocide Memorial, where I worked for 10 years, was another learning and transformative experience that helped me uh, deal with the legacy of, of, of my, my past. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Clava. Maybe you have a question for Janine, Clava. Yes, I do. Um, it's probably two questions in one. One is uh, learning from you as a Holocaust survivor. Uh, you've been telling your story for the last more than 50 years, I would say. Uh, so my first question is um, really what, what motivates you and what pushes you to, to tell your story? And subsequent to that, in all these many years you've been telling your story, um, uh, is there anything you found helpful in, in, in terms of advice that you could share with us survivors of the genocide against the Tutsi in Rwanda when it becomes to uh, storytelling and memory transmission? Thank you. Uh, well, uh, what motivates me? I think I really believe that it's very important to tell the story of how what happened during the war. Because without me speaking, nobody would know what happened to my family. There are very few survivors of Lvov, so it's very important. And I've been always, I'm always welcomed by students, teachers, Adults, wherever I go, I have an incredible welcome and warmth. And I just hope that my story will help young people to, to remember, because one has to remember what happened. One mustn't allow persecution to happen again. And I fear about this is a problem which I fear a lot, that genocides are still happening. So I wonder if you have any hope that it will, the genocide will stop one day, that people will become all, all will become more humane towards each other. Thank you. Krabba, do you want to answer that question? Do you, what kind of hope do you have that people are more humane and will genocide ever end? Um, that is the hope I have. But that hope isn't just a, a hope that is, um, it, it's a hope that builds on the effort we make today as humanity together. We, 
when we see things happening, bad things happening, and we raise our voices, then we are doing something to bring that hope. Uh, so I uh, would um, agree with Janine that uh, we need to tell our stories. We need to be upfront and, 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 and teach people who did not live through what we lived through. Uh, for them to know uh, that in the end, it is not uh, maybe races, ethnicities that lose. It is the entire humanity. Because taking an example of Rwanda, yes, Tutsi were murdered, were killed, and few who survived, we are living with that shock. But on the other side, perpetrators of this genocide also left uh, a permanent mark to their family members. Yeah. You know, some of them live with guilty, uh, guilt by association. So we should all understand that violence uh, brings nothing but really uh, this long-standing um, uh, shame on us. And therefore we must join our effort together to uh, combat this. Mm -hmm. Thank you. It's exactly mm. how I feel. Mm. Thank, you. Thank you both. I want to open up now to uh, others who are joining us on Facebook and who have questions. Uh, first of all, I want to welcome uh, Sokbal Din, um, who is a survivor of the Cambodian genocide, um, who is is on the line with us and I hope Sokpal that you will be able to uh, at the end uh, of uh, this hour light a candle with us in memory of your family and communities that were uh, destroyed uh, in the Cambodian genocide over four decades ago. Um, there is a question uh, uh, from Nicola Strauser, um, uh, Janine, and I think this can also be for you Claver, that uh, on a daily basis on a normal day how much is the Holocaust on your mind? And Clever, for you, how much is the, is the genocide 26 years ago on your mind on a normal day? So, do you want me to answer first? Yes, please, Jenny. Okay, uh, well, uh, of course, I cannot forget. I cannot... I must confess, forgive those who killed my family. But I am not angry with the young Germans. And they are not responsible what happened. But for me, it's something, I live now a normal life. I have children, grandchildren, friends, and I try to live as normally as I can. But the lockdown now reminded me a little of what happened during the war. And for me, it took me a long time to come to terms with what happened. In fact, for 50 years, I wasn't able to talk about it. It's only if with help of a, uh, of a psychologist that I managed to speak out. Mm. Clava, how much uh, for is me, genocide on your mind on a daily basis? I would say that uh, the history of genocide for me, it's, it's part of who I am, I must confess. Uh, uh, I, I, I cannot say it, it comes in my mind in the morning or mm. night. It's, it, it's my life now, especially now that I have kids who uh, have started asking me questions about my past, about my childhood, about my, 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 my parents, who are their grandparents and so on. And you know Rwanda, you know how the landscape is and you know we have memorials everywhere. So we have uh, things that remind us of this past. And for me, I would say it, it's, 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 it is integrated in our daily life, but at the same time, uh, for me, I live it in a positive way by, um, you know, sourcing energy from, from what I went through and working hard to make sure that it doesn't happen to my uh, kids and my country. Both of you have 
answered this question, this following question in some way, but I, I, I want to read it because Gary Mulraney asks it so eloquently. Uh, Clava and Janine, my heart goes out to both of you. How do you forgive nameless, faceless perpetrators who forever changed the course of your lives? You've both touched on this in one way yes. or another. Yes. Um, yes. Yes, yes. And I, yes. I, I know, Janine, you said that, that you can't forgive, but no. you don't blame the young people. No, but I cannot forgive. I, can, I cannot forgive the killing of innocent people, wherever they are, whoever they are, of killing of children. How is it possible to understand, to accept? But... I, as I said, I don't, I, in my life, personal life, I'm not angry because I'm not angry with the young generations. And I continue giving talks. For me, it's extremely important. And I think I have a fairly good life and I have a wonderful family and they help me a lot. Mm. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Janine. Okay. Uh, James, I, I think forgiveness is a strong word uh, for anybody and it requires to be in that situation where you have uh, someone asking for forgiveness. And now back to nameless people uh, being forgiven. I, I would say for me that, you know, it, it is one of the th those things you say, let it go for you to live a better life. Um, and that's how I've been dealing with that because no one came to me to ask for forgiveness. Yes. And yes. Um, I feel ready, but I don't know how that would um, really happen unless I'm in that specific, in that very um, specific configuration to see how I would stand and, and, and act. But all I know for sure is that I have no hatred for them. I have no... Um, the spirit of revenge to them. The only revenge I have is, is this positivity in life of doing what is good, doing what is there to save humanity. Mm. Thank you. Um, we've had a lot of questions uh, about um, young people in education and, and storytelling. And I, I wanted to bring in uh, our colleague from uh, Central African Republic, uh, Alan Lazaret, who works with Aegis Trust. He's um, actually just unable to, to connect right now, but I spoke to him earlier uh, and recorded his remarks and asked him, uh, first of all, to set a scene uh, about what is happening in Central African Republic, um, um, because they have been taking the storytelling uh, of Aegis Trust, the work that you've been undertaking at Kigala Genocide Memorial, uh, Clava, and um, incorporating it not only after a conflict and after genocide, but where there is growing uh, violence to uh, intervene. And we wanted to hear from uh, Alan about how, how storytelling is working um, in the middle of a crisis. Alan, thank you for joining us from the Central African Republic in what is uh, very challenging circumstances for you at the moment. Um, for those joining us who perhaps know little about what has been happening in CAR, the Central African Republic, over the past seven or eight years, can you give a brief summary? Thank you, James. Um, so in 2012, there was kind of a coup led by people coming from the north. And so the coup created kind of like civil, civil and war. People were killing each other, Muslim Christians. And then after, uh, there was uh, the UN coming in and then the presidential elections. The country with the new president and new government is, has been stable for a while, but now things are very unstable. We've been discussing today on this, uh, this call about how both at the National Holocaust Center in the UK and at Kigali Genocide Memorial, storytelling has been a very important part of transmission of memory, but also education of the current generation. Can you describe from your experience in CAR how 
storytelling may help to prevent atrocities and contribute to the building of peace. Thank you, James. Uh, storytelling works two ways. The first one is uh, when the person has been going through like um, a crisis or a genocide or a, a, a victim of something very uh, difficult that happened to him. For example, someone who came from Rwanda, one of the victims, he testified, he gave his story at the National Assembly. And his story sparked nationwide a sense of, of like empathy and, and, and personal responsibilities. So when you hear the storytelling from someone else who has been in a difficult situation, it impacts your life and leads you to do something. And other way, if the storytelling coming from someone like a lady in car who lost her child, the child was killed by one of the militias and the body of the child was cut with machetes and dropped into a well. She had never seen the body of her son. But while testifying every day, when she gives a story, she says, the time when I see people listening to my story and hearing what happened to me, whenever I share it, I feel a kind of weight being like lifted off from my shoulders because sharing the story, telling the story of what happened to me gives me a kind of relief. So that lady uh, is really helping a lot here in CAR with different people going through different situations. So storytelling helps a lot, but both ways. The person who is sharing the story and the person who is hearing the story, they both get this kind of uh, empathy and personal responsibility that leads them to like act by standard chief. So I wanted to bring Alan into this conversation to show how the storytelling of Holocaust survivors and genocide survivors, uh, such as yourself, Janine, um, and Clava um, at the two memorial centers in the UK and Rwanda um, is having an impact way beyond um, your own family, your own communities. It's helping to influence others now who are working um, in places where genocide and atrocities are at risk. And it's a great legacy that you, know, you through the courage of sharing your stories for your different motives, for young people, for your families, uh, is helping to reach out and I believe provide protection uh, for those at, at risk today and I wanted to really thank you for all the work that you have done um, over the years both at the UK um, National Holocaust uh, Centre and at the Kigali Genocide uh, Memorial uh, Janine and uh, Clava. We are um, having to move on to the next part and the final part of our um, program uh, now and I want to uh, bring in um, Marion Bango um, who you see is with us um, uh, who will be playing the uh, final uh, piece of music. Um, Marion, uh, first of all um, the band, your group Gypsy Life, can you tell us just very briefly about uh, the group that you work with uh, that you founded in London? Yeah. Can you hear me? Yes. Okay. Oh, can yes. yes, thank you. Uh, yes, yeah. your group, Gypsy Life. Oh, yes. We started we start about four years ago, but those different musicians. And we start as a as a klezmer music, as a klezmer band. And uh, yes, I, uh, I started study as well two, <clears throat> three years ago. And somehow some of the students came to me and they said, oh, yes, don't be, it would be good if we, if we set up some some band and play the gypsy music. And we agreed, but <clears throat> we, we perform very, very randomly, not very often. And uh, because of the study and all the duties, but the last few months, I would say about from the, about from the October, we were, we were really going for it. And we were like, uh, finally set up, set up the musicians and we were going very serious about it. Um, so that's, that's the body gypsy lies. Mm. Mm. In this setup, we play, we play in a few months, actually. And the, the Roma, uh, Romani people are, you know, forgotten often in the history of the Holocaust. And uh, even across Europe today, the 
ongoing uh, you know, discrimination, even persecution uh, of the Roma. Many hundreds of thousands, maybe more than a million, were murdered um, uh, under the under the Nazis. Um, uh, I grew up in um, Nottinghamshire in the Midlands, and there's a large Irish traveller community there. Um, and uh, the prejudice and dis the discrimination against that community was was widespread uh, and, and and rife. And you grew up in what was then Czechoslovakia, um, now Eastern Slovakia or Western Slovakia. And could you, um, what experience did you have in terms of the attitude to Roma when you were growing up in what was then Czechoslovakia? Uh, <clears throat> when I, because as a child I was growing up in the that was the communist communist system, so I didn't I didn't feel it that I was I was I was Roma, but the <clears throat> the society or the mood in the society started to change when after the collapse after 80, 89, after the collapse of the of the of the of the regime, and the first time I really I was I I met it face to face kind of. I was I was soldier of the Czechoslovakian army at that time because that was the duty, and I served in the in the Czech Czech Republic. And uh, the first time, and it's never happened to me, and they just refused to serve me. I just came there to have a food, and they refused to serve me. And I was waiting about 45 minutes, and eventually the waitress came and she says, "We are not serving the gypsies. Mm. You are not welcome here." Did you, ever, did you ever hear from your family um, stories about the experience of of the Romani people under the Nazis? Well, my my grandfather he was in the concentration camp in Dubnica, but he never he was never talked about mm. what he what he experienced. Even if his brother when he came, his brother they never talked only when <clears throat> them sister came to visit and she was talking sometimes about it and she was crying but they used the roma romani language and i didn't understand because the grandfather didn't taught my mom romani language mm. what's the reason i don't know so none of them none of the <clears throat> my parents sister and brothers none of them speak the romani I started to learn Romani language when I when I was working in the East Slovakia, mm. and I started by myself. Mm. Can you tell us about the song that we're going to hear to uh, play us out, a piece of music? Yes, <clears throat> the the song calls "Chayori Romani," which means Romani girl, and it was created uh, in the concentration camp somewhere in Czechoslovakian concentration camp and uh, <clears throat> it appears straight after the second world war but it was played in the roma community more or less and uh, then in early 70s even non-romani non-romani uh, bands played that and it was the kind of the part of the repertoire of the non-romani non-romani bands and the, even the the great singers or the stars of the Czechoslovakia and the, the music, they 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 sang this this song. Mm -hmm. uh, they non-Roma people know it in Czechoslovakia. They they know it more or less as a gypsy tears or gypsy cry. Thank you. And we're going to hear this um, beautiful piece of music uh, now. And um, as we hear gypsy tears or gypsy cry, um, it, it's a hugely important anthem for the Romani people, um, particularly as they remember the persecution under the Nazis. But for today we will be joined uh, by others and uh, we hope this can be a lament for all victims of genocide that we're remembering today with the Jewish victims of the Holocaust, the Armenian um, victims, uh, Bosnian Muslim victims, uh, Tutsis, uh, and uh, as we're all lighting our candles um, as you play, uh, play us out of this um, this, this, this hour, I do want to draw attention again that we have Sokbal Din, uh, who will be the first to light his candle in memory of the victims of the Cambodian genocide. Thank you, Marianne. <laughs> Thank you. 
Thank you all for being with us today for this Together We Remember event in Genocide Awareness Month. Thank you everyone. That was such an incredibly moving experience uniting two countries, Rwanda, the United Kingdom, and folks all over the world on the final day of Genocide Awareness Month. Um, the sun is rising here in the United States and we have a variety of programs uh, coming over towards our coast, but the next program is starting shortly. Uh, we'll be joined by some folks here in the U.S. as well as in Spain. So thank you again, James, um, and your teams in the U.K. as well as in Ru Rwanda for such a special program. Um, it was incredibly, incredibly moving. Thank you for allowing us and uh, providing this great uh, opportunity, David. Of course. <laughs>